What's up, Red Letter Disciples? It's Zach Zinder, and in a moment, I'm going to be joined with Pastor Chris Johnson, co-host of the Red Letter Disciple. This podcast exists to challenge you to be a greater disciple of Jesus. We got another killer episode today. We also have a first. We are welcoming a Hawaiian onto the show. That's right, Jeff Mueller on the podcast today. He's been a pastor for decades and several years ago moved back to Hawaii to pastor it's a church. We're going to find out there's some surprising things about what it's like to be a disciple in Hawaii. But what I really love about Jeff is his heart to reach the one that everyone else may be avoiding or missing. We're going to find out why Jeff has that heart and how he helps others as founder and president of Child Beyond International um, to do this, to rescue some of these vulnerable children, specifically in the nation of Guatemala. Speaking of rescue, have you ever needed to be rescued? Maybe you were in a predicament that just got out of control or maybe physically or figuratively, you were drowning and going down for the last time and a strong arm reached out and pulled you back to the surface. In the spiritual sense, the answer for all of us is yes, we have needed to be rescued, and we were through Jesus. By our own sin, when we were in a broken relationship with God, we were in need of rescue, and that's exactly what Jesus has done for us. And now, after Jesus has rescued us as disciples, he calls us to be rescuers of others. And that's, again, exactly what Child Beyond International does. I just so love the work that they do that I wanted you to hear their powerful work overseas. And so today you are hearing from Jeff Mueller, their founder and president, and he's going to share more about what God is doing through Child Beyond International. But I'll say it up front. There's a couple ways to get in touch with CBI. One is their website, childbeyond.org. If you're a church leader uh, looking to partner with an incredible overseas mission effort to rescue the lost, Child Beyond is your group. They're, they're, they're your organization to do that. And secondly, Jeff is going to be joining me really shortly on April 11th for a free webinar that is designed for pastors and church leaders. We'll put the link to register for that in our show notes at redletterpodcast.com. But that'll be a specific time to talk to church leaders about the importance of global ministry and how your global impact doesn't just change the life of the one on the other end, but also those who participate in your church as well. It's going to be a great webinar. It's going to be a great podcast today. Before we get to it, hey, remember, if you're a listener of the Red Letter Disciple, would you send us a five-star rating and write a review? I I love running into listeners of Red Letter Disciple, and at the same time, I'm like, I didn't know you listened, because like nobody reviews our show. We want you to review our show. Um, So here's me begging you to do that. That would be really helpful for us to keep going. It's really awesome to make a difference in your life, and so if this podcast is doing that, let us know what's your favorite episode. And not just writing reviews, but when you subscribe and follow on your favorite platforms, that really helps as well. So with all of that, my begging is now done. Let's get to today's episode with Jeff Mueller. Let's do this. Well, Chris, today's episode, I'm pretty excited. We got Jeff Mueller on the Red Letter Disciple today. Jeff is currently the senior pastor. Don't get jealous. Don't get jealous of Waikoloa. Lutheran Church in Waikoloa, Wait a second. Hawaii. Hold on a second. How do you get that kind of gig? We're going to find here, out. No, 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 no. You're here in the middle of the country <laughs> in Nebraska, uh, and it is like 45 degrees. Which is nice. Uh, yeah, he's saying yeah. it's nice. This guy somehow finagles his yeah. way down to Hawaii. I want to know. Let's just cut right to the chase. Oh, let's, you don't want any more of his bio? No, I just want to figure out how to be a, a pastor in Hawaii. Go ahead. All right, let's go. We're going to get more of your bio later then. How'd you get there, Jeff? Yeah. Well, I'd like to figure out how to be a pastor in Florida, Chris. Like, wow. <laughs> I'll switch. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Some of yeah, I actually am in shorts and barefoot, um, <laughs> and it's about 78 degrees at 8.30 in the morning. So That's pretty yeah, great. Yeah, it is. Yeah, you're... Yeah, anyway. But it's rough. For those- it's rough because you have to watch TV shows like the college football at like five in the morning. That's the problem. It is. Yeah. And, and you know, you get up early for all these recordings and stuff like that. You're right. <laughs> it's it's two hours behind the, we're five hours behind you guys. Or wow. Four, or well, anyway. Some of us are, so, are doing the Lord's work in places that others wouldn't yeah. go to, uh, <laughs> like the Midwest. Let me quickly answer Chris's, you know, the Holy Spirit brought us here, okay. as we all know doctrinally. That's why I'm yeah. here. Okay? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I love it. And yeah. some some so people, cool. the Holy Spirit just has a little more favor for than others. <laughs> I think that's what we're deciding here. But Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, when I took the call to, to Honolulu way back when, 2003, all the guys, my buddies, were all jealous, blah, blah, blah. And I, you know, I said, 
man, you guys have no idea. For a while, I had not seen the beach for two months because the work is so deep mm. and dark there mm. in uh, Oahu, in Honolulu. Wow. Spiritual warfare galore. So, wow. yeah, you come over for your vacations, and I'd like to have you take me over to the beach. So, yeah. there you go. There you go. I remember after the seminary, the one dude got called to Alaska, and he was like, what <laughs> oh. did I do wrong? Like, who did I tick <laughs> off in the call committee? That is crazy, that, oh, yeah. that, uh, that time for those who do go to seminary, at least in our denomination, there's a call day and you genuinely, like you can tell and put in requests, but you don't know where you're going. Yeah. And so a lot of people end up in places like, oh, cool, great. And a lot of it's like, oh, okay. And then someone's like, oh, really? Wait, wait what? <laughs> Anchorage, Alaska. Fantastic. I'm so pumped right. with my with my new yeah. baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jeff, you have pastored a, a few churches. And uh, one of the things I love about everywhere you pastor or have pastored you, you plant new churches and new ministries. And one of the ministries that you started was Child Beyond International, mm. which has a passion to rescue vulnerable children, specifically in the nation of Guatemala. A really great organization. I want to hear more about that uh, as we go through this. But uh, I'm curious, you know, we joke around, uh, joke around about being in Hawaii, uh, and, and you mentioned there's, there's darkness there too. And so, like, is it easier or harder to be uh, an effective disciple in Hawaii than the continental 48 because you've been you've been on this side for a while too mm -hmm. yeah i've asked I've, I've been in hawaii honolulu for eight years here for over a year and then the rest of my 30 years of uh, ministry was uh, in california and oregon and both of those places you know very spiritually dark and especially oregon uh but i gotta be honest i just really don't think there's much difference in any of the the american places we could go Hawaii is very American with all the bells and whistles that the enemy can dangle in front of us to go off in directions that are away from God. And um, it's a very faithless place, mm. just like Oregon was, just like California is, just like, you know, even Nebraska is. Um, but bottom line is not really any difference here. You, you, you have to understand the culture differently. Yeah. You have to embrace and um, respect the culture wherever you're at. Oregon is so different culturally than Hawaii. But ultimately, there's there's very little difference between the mainland and the Big Island and Oahu when it comes to the deep need for the love of Jesus yeah. and his salvation. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. So one of the things you said in your opening statement, uh, Pastor Jeff, you said that uh, you, and it just kind of stuck to me because we haven't talked about uh, this yeah. a lot, was you said that there was a great deal of spiritual war warfare. Um, so what are some of the things that you see in Hawaii? Well, Oahu, crazy. Um, that city, you know, Honolulu, where we, my church was, uh, we, the religious battles that are going on there, and under the surface, no one is actually physically fighting each other, but you have Buddhism and Shintoism and huge Mormon influence and Jehovah's oh, really? Witnesses. Hmm. Oh, yeah. It's all over the place. And on top of all that, with the spiritual warfare, there is a huge racism issue oh, that's yeah. unspoken in, in Oahu. You got to think about it. Generations after generations of migrants came over from different places all over the world. And as they got their kids educated, they moved up and the next wave of migration came in and they were below them. And so you have the Howleys, the white people at the top, and then the Chinese Mandarins, and then the Cantonese Mandarins are down below there, the Filipinos, the Japanese are way up high, the Hawaiians are in the middle somewhere. The Micronesians are way at the bottom. The Mexicans and the Spanish speaking people are now making waves over. And so there's racism mm. galore there, which is really tragic. So the spiritual warfare in Honolulu was, you know, palpable. Mm. Here on the Big Island, it's just everyone's just goofing off and living their life and, and enjoying the, the beauty and not really thinking about their destiny after they leave this earth, this well, paradise on earth. When, when you think about it, if you're going to be a young Mormon riding a bike, where what where better place, you know, there or St. Yeah. Paul, Minnesota? Come on, you know. Yeah. No, well, you know, I mean, the Mormons are huge in Oahu. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. We just but had an episode it, it, about uh, cults uh, the last, yeah. uh, which was yeah. really compelling. Go check that out. So when you're on the Big Island now, I heard you say it's a different issue. Oh, oh, every place has its issues. Um, in Oahu yeah. is maybe more focused, or there's at least a, a, a more of a systemic racism. In Big Island, it's mm. 
yeah, p- people are just gazing on the beauty and the comfort that comes from this world. And so how do you, how do you, cause that's something we also experience in, even in Omaha, Nebraska and other places is like the people just living for now in this world. And, and yeah. it's a good world a lot of times. And we have found success. I don't f- think there's a lot of people that, you know, talk about success and how to handle it or, or collective prosperity and how to handle it well. Mm-hmm. And I just see a lot of people today that are living for today as like it's all there is. So how do you yeah. intersect into well, that culture and bring the good news of Jesus? Well, hold on a they second. They don't even know they need it. Mark Zuckerberg is building a gigantic bunker. He's not <laughs> thinking about today. He's thinking about tomorrow. There you go. Yeah. So, what's the answer? How do you how do you get people to think about Jesus in a culture that's beautiful and in a world that's like today is all there is? You know, the only way is relationships. Developing mm-hmm. the one on one relationships, really, yeah. because Satan has gotten such a, a stronghold on people's attention spans, mm-hmm. and especially here on the on the Big Island, it's, there's so much to do that's not anything related to God, and it's just nice. It's relaxing. It's fun. And so we, our church is uh, right now currently uh, renting a, a space right at the golf course, right across from the putting green and the practice greens of our beautiful golf course. And I love golf, and I, I know, Zach, you do too. Yeah. And you're going to play golf here someday. But uh, ultimately, you, you, we're develop, I'm developing relationships deeply with all the golf staff and 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 slowly growing their trust and and their appreciation and develop I joined the Lions Club so mm-hmm. that we can develop a relationship and and give back to the community that way it's just building long-term positive relationships because they know I'm a pastor and I'm one of those Christians and so what it takes is um genuine care and genuine investment. So there's no quick fix anymore. Yeah. I mean, there's no big evangelism explosion. Um, you know, the crusades, uh, none of that really, in, in my opinion, now works. It's always deeply going into the relationship. So it's a commitment. It's a discipleship commitment. And that's why I'm so thankful for Red Letter, red letter Living. And that's why I'm wearing my red liturgical <laughs> lay. The Red Letter Lay, I like it, yeah. For those of you who can see, it's my Pentecostal. LA. I wear <laughs> so I have a question. That, I have a question that's kind of off script. My mom was a military uh, kid, and she was born in Hawaii, and then lived there for like eight years, and had to move off. And she then the next move was to Iowa, and she mm. said she cried the whole time <laughs> because it was December, and she didn't want to leave. Uh, do you ever experience the the island uh, like? You okay? This is a beautiful place. It's heaven on earth. But uh, do you ever like say to yourself, "Man, I, I'm kind of over this. Do I want to go back to the states." Like, do you ever get a moment of that? <laughs> no, it's it's called island fever, That's and it's right. a legitimate issue. And okay. and it's in all the islands except the Big Island. So, little fun fact about our islands: uh, the Big Island's forty forty five hundred square miles, mm-hmm. and it's growing because the volcano just keeps adding lava to the ends of the island. And uh, so you can fit all the other five main islands tw- twice over on okay. top of this island to still have some room. And this island has 11 of the 13 world's microclimates represented. Wow. So if you live on the big island, I have never felt that. Uh, okay. On Oahu, when I was there, it was a little few times, you know, I had to get off the island. Where did I go? I went to the big island. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's where I fell in love with Waikoloa with my wife on our vacations. And that's why God was preparing us years and years ago to have our, what well, I pray is our final call uh, here on uh, the Big Island at Waikoloa <laughs> until we go home to heaven. This is our launching pad, I, like that. I pray. Awesome. I like that. And I think it's good. God, I think God listens to like, hey, God, I, I like the call here and I'd, I'd like this to be my last call. <laughs> Whether yeah. he agrees or not, you know, we don't, we don't always know. We always got to go where he leads. You but, know, yeah. I'm 64 years young. Yeah. I don't know if he has more plans than, than another <laughs> call somewhere else. But I, if he does, he better keep me healthy. Yeah, we'll pray. We'll pray against it. We we want you to stay there. <laughs> Thank but. you. Well, well I guess I want, I mean, you have to have a place to come visit. I'll, I have a room. I guess that goes against Zach's plan of having you move here to plant a church. I, so <laughs> we'll see how. Yeah, not we'll Nebraska. Sorry. Right. Yeah, there you go. Uh, speaking. Well, God, of, I mean it. Whatever you want, God. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of planting a church, uh, like I mentioned, you're a, a starter. Uh, you have helped uh, start churches uh, and start ministries, and so. Like, how do you know, like, what to start? Because it hasn't always mm. been, like, a, it's been both churches and ministries. So how do you know, like, what to start and what steps to take? You know, I've been accused, and I've I self-identified myself as having spiritual ADD. 
<laughs> and uh, I mean, I after a while, my the way he's made me is like, what? Let's try something new. God, what do you want to do? Is that right? Okay, so basically, with my personality specifically, I've never tried to start anything. I've just said. God, what do you want to do? And you show me and I'll do whatever you want me to do. And he showed me. And so, you know, I think it's really important that we all understand that we don't do something and say, God bless this. We always say, God, what are you blessing? Can we be a part of that? Yeah. And that's what he's been doing uh, in my 30 plus years of, of ministry. It's been so humbling that he's placed this great commission passion in my heart that's just burning all the time, sometimes fervor and sometimes a little flicker, but it's there. And and the most important reason we're here on this earth, and I know you boys, my, my, yeah, I'm, I'm an old man, so I can call you boys, um, can, can understand this, is that this is, well, this is really what it's all about as a Christian on this earth until we go home to heaven is really to keep our focus on the main thing, and that's to share Jesus with our world, one person at a time, one soul at a time. And, and it, then it's over. Once we leave, no more chances. You know, everyone up there knows the gospel. So it's... <laughs> It's so so that's that's what he's done. And it's been such a fun ride. Yeah. Um, I, I have a little saying on my wall by my desk. It says the Christian life should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in an attractive and well-preserved body, but rather to skid in sideways, thoroughly used up, totally worn out and screaming. Woohoo! What a ride. That's, <laughs> I that. that's my life. I want that to be my life. Come I want on. that. That's good. Yeah. Like the, like the well, tombstone. There's nothing left to give. You know, that's, that's what I want written on my tombstone. So, like the 500th I mean, lap of the Indy 500, the cars, the, the, the wheels are falling off and you're just sliding <laughs> <yeah>. in. <laughs> Big mess. But who cares? That. We get a new body when we go home. You know, I mean, <laughs> right. I, after the second, when the bodily resurrection comes in, we're anyway. That's that's in answer to your question. I, you know, it's just wherever you go, you look for what God's blessing, and you, you ask Him to let you be a part of that because it's just so much fun. Yeah. It's just such a thrill to serve Him like that, and He's 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 shown me so many crazy things. Like in Honolulu, we we our church adopted the public school right next door. It was in probation. It was about to go through a whole re remake. And we came to the principal and said, what can we do? We were doing prayer walks around your, your, your school. And we know we're a church, but we'll be, you know, we'll behave. This is a very liberal democratic state, but can we help? Yes. Desperate. In three years, it turned around to be the blue ribbon school of Hawaii. And our yeah. youth director went to Washington DC with the principal to receive the blue ribbon award. I mean, that's just one story. Yeah. There's no wow. church state separation with God. And yeah. we got to start six mission churches in five cultures and languages on Oahu. And same thing with Hood River. We did so many amazing things in Oregon that God, uh, that people would say, you can't do that. And I was, well, we did it. <laughs> God did it. We just got to be a part of it. Yeah. Huge things. And, and now in Waikoloa, you know, rebirth in a 30-year-old Lutheran mission. And, and then starting this beautiful thing called Eden Above the Sea. And, you know, we can talk about that some other time. But. Anyway, that's the answer. Cool. It's just that's how it happened. That's so good. Uh, and I want to know, Jeff, from your perspective then, if it's like, cool, we're not forcing something and telling God, hey, you join me. We're looking for where God is is already moving. Like, how, how do you... How do you find that? Like, where do, you, where do you know? How do you know God is moving? I think there's a lot of people that like the intent behind that is really good and they want that, but they don't always see or recognize where God is moving. Yeah. So what are some of the things you look for? Huge. First thing is prayer. Mm. We, we have to be yeah. people of prayer and, and surrender our own eyes and say, God, give me your eyes for what you want me to do. And, and so often, you know, I really want to encourage our brothers and sisters who are listening here that. You know, it doesn't have to be a, a massive movement of a church like some of the things I just shared were more of a church focus. The discipled church does these things. But ultimately, it, the individual disciple of Jesus, the Lord will show you yeah. if you pray and say, Lord, give me your eyes for my neighbor or for a, a project in the community uh, that I live in, that I love and I care about or in my own church. What can I do, Lord? that can start something. And then you just take that first step with them and then the next step. And pretty soon you're, you're looking back and you're saying, woohoo, what a ride. <laughs> That's the goal. It's At true. the end, we want to say what a ride. I, I'm picking that up. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Wow. That was a blast. <laughs> That's, you know, cool. That's the kind of life you would, I would think any child of God filled with his spirit would want to live. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I love that. So it all starts with prayer. 
and, and, and taking that step, like when you hear God moving, I think uh, there's a line in one of Donald Miller's books of, you know, a lot of people are waiting for like, what's that one thing that mm. God wants me to do? And, you know, he, he talks about in the book that we all live out a story. And if you feel like you're not living out a good story, find someone who is living out a good yeah. story for a noble cause and just join them. And so I think, yeah. you know, alongside of prayer, it's like, who's in your life? that's doing a great work that you can be a part, a part of. If, if God's not giving you direction for something yourself, like he's given other people dreams that are doing it and how to, how to, and step into that. And that's what I really see you doing. Cause it's not the same things you're doing at each church. Like some, sometimes you've planted new churches, but sometimes you've planted, we'll talk a little later about child beyond international, a global mm -hmm. mission. Like that, that wasn't thought up by you. It was thought up by the people. I, I, and you, I don't coming. speak Spanish. And it's still like, <laughs> wow, I'm right. in charge of this thing. God, please help me. Wow. <laughs> I this is it. just another one of those crazy God things. Yeah. So cool. You've been in ministry then for about four decades, it sounds like. So what are some of the shifts when you've seen uh, that you've seen when it comes to discipleship um, in, in your own ministry over those four decades? Wow. I mean, we don't. Uh, this is <laughs> how long. Do we have? That, yeah, we don't have enough time for this. Um, I would. But I would honestly use the word seismic as far as the shifts mm -hmm. in discipleship. I really believe that that they're dramatic and not nest, not in a good, positive or healthy way to be really honest about the, the way that our church, the church, I would say, you know, the evangelical church in America, let's specifically say most likely the listeners are you know, part of an evangelical church in America. I, I think we've really kind of ultimately failed. And I think our leaders, we, the leaders have failed to adjust quickly enough and effectively enough and adequately enough to the dramatic cultural yeah. changes in attitudes and belief systems over the last 20 years. Uh, the world does not see us any longer as relevant. Churches, you know, pastors oh. used to be the leaders of the community and respected, right. and churches right. were the community center. Mm -hmm. and, and now not only do so many see us as irrelevant, but a lot of people, and it's growing, see us as a direct threat to their chosen way of life. Yeah. And, do you th do you so think that's really, because do you think that sorry to interrupt do you think that's because people no, are just ahead. do you I think that, you're an interrupter and that's a good thing go ahead <laughs> do you think that's because people are just, in the last few years have just found community in so many other places you know like I've I've contemplated that question too like you know I mean, growing up you you would see like that was part of the routine everybody just went especially in the Midwest you'd go to church and and then do you do your groups and you'd have meals together. And now it just seems like people, it's not the same community, but they're finding it at their golf course, at their bar, at, you know, like, I, I don't know. There's so, on, on social media, of course, is like the one thing, you know, we could, like I said, we don't have enough time, but the Holy Spirit uh, has revealed so many ways that we could reach those people through all those venues. If we would just go as right. disciples and get involved in those things. And that's what I'm, you know, what I'm saying that we haven't quickly adjusted fast enough. But here's the good news, in my opinion: we we must, and we I believe we can learn these new ways of truly being effective disciples in these brand new cultures, these subcultures that are. Uh, it came from the, the the huge mass media and and um, uh, worldwide web, if you want to go back to Gore's term, uh, way back when. And now look what the results are, and people don't have to go anywhere to have relationships mm -hmm. and stay in front of their screen right. and supposedly have relationships. But, uh, you know, one of the things that I'm really passionate about is to go to those places, get involved in those things that, that of course, not some of the really ungodly things that are out there, but be involved in those things that you can be. And, and our, like, for instance, Waikoloa Lutheran's theme verse for 2024 is Ephesians 5, 8 through 10, quickly, for you were once darkness and we all were. Mm -hmm. yeah. But now you are light in the Lord. So that's our new identity. That's our being. That's the challenge of being. We are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And then here's the big one. Big one. Here's what disciples said really about. And find out what pleases the Lord. Hmm. And so we're, we're really, we're, we're in that place in Ephesians 5, 8 through 10, all of this year to get to a place where we're about ready to build our building, we have our property, and we're gonna reach out to this community, uh, this village in a way it's never been reached out to before. But anywhere, wherever we are, wherever you're listening, you can do the very same thing because you're light in the Lord, that's your identity. That's good. 
Yeah, I love that. And find I love that. Find out what pleases the Lord. You know, it's not everything is good because of what Christ has done when we talk about salvation and and you know eternity with him with that belief in him but uh, I, I i think that we really can yeah and and we ought to strive to please the lord and you know put a smile on his face and and i think there are things that we can do that you know make god proud uh, you know if jesus was his embodiment and he came into this world and he was pleased and he was amazed like we can please and we can amaze god with our faith and the things we do Amen. and that's pretty cool to think about and and so I, I, you know when i see god looking down uh, on on you, I see him smiling. He's amazed at your faith because you're passionate about reaching people, and I think you're passionate about reaching people that that he is and would be passionate about reaching. Um, I because th- I think you really uh, through Child Beyond International, uh, you're, you're really focused on rescuing uh, the person that no one else wants to rescue. And so before we talk about how you do that at Child Beyond, like what makes you so passionate to rescue uh, the ones that others would overlook or forget? Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I was about to say one more thing before you dump that on me, um, which is, of course, I would love to be dumped on with that. Uh, <laughs> well, feel free if you, wanna, wanna, if you wanna say the one thing uh, and then go, go. No, I wanna say this one thing, it's really important. Uh, you know, the, the Bible is our, is our source believers instructions before leaving earth, that acronym, it truly is our source for understanding what God's will is. What, what pleases the Lord? We'll read it in his love letter, the Bible, and you'll find it. But I will tell you, and you did not ask me to say this, and I, you know, this isn't a part of our partnership, but I am just so thankful for you, Zach, and whoever has helped you develop the red letter books. And mm. from the very first one, red letter challenge to the bean, which is identities, everything to the forgiving, which is critical <laughs> to what you just, I mean, come on, where's the next book? Cause I just finished serving. <laughs> My wife and I had Give me like 20 months, room. 20 months. You'll have it in your hands. Oh, yeah. man, what am I going to do? I'm going to have to just keep going on my own. Cause I know it's sending. Um, but I just want to say to everybody, if you had a, and this is not a commercial, this is from a guy that's not getting anything from this, <laughs> except that I've really been blessed mm-hmm. and our church is being blessed by every book and, and, and all the ways you shared it, your personality, your, out, your heart, your passions, but it's all God's word coming mm-hmm. out at us every day, every challenge of the 40 days of each book. And it's, if you want to know what to do and how to do it, it starts with you know, getting these books and, and reading one after another in the right order. And it doesn't take you that very long, four 40 days and you got it. And then we have to wait forever for the next book. But ultimately, ultimately I'm just letting you know, everybody that I've been really blessed by all of these books and that mm. they are super helpful in determining how to be a disciple of Christ in a dark and difficult world, how mm. to be a light, a child of light. You read these books. Amen. All right. Now back to the question. I don't don't mind you pausing uh, and not taking my question for that. That was great. (laughs) Uh, No, I I genuinely appreciate that, Jeff. You've you've said that before to me and I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah, I, I, I just am so grateful. Thank you. Some, I think some people um, are. I think some people are waiting for like Netflix. You know, they wait for the whole series to come out before they start <laughs> yeah, watching it. Read. You know, no, so read I, them now. <laughs> there you go. So read cool. Yeah, what, what, what gives? What gives you that passion then to rescue that that one that uh, again would, uh, well, others would forget or overlook? Well, I you know you could start with a question. Really, have have you ever been rescued from a predicament that was totally out of your control? And it sounds like Chris almost was jumping. He told us a story before we got on about jumping off a cliff into the water in Hawaii and he was scared stiff, but he made it. <laughs> but were, were, were you, you know, you have to ask this question of everybody. Were you ever drowning and going down for the last time and, and some strong arm mm. reached out and pulled mm. back to the surface? And, and the answer to every single one of us is yes. Mm-hmm. We yeah. all have been rescued. Every one of us is at, at a time in our life we're spiritually dead. We are spiritual orphans. Mm. Every single one of us need to be rescued from our sin. But the incredible news is that now that as as a Christian, as a child of light, we're no longer orphans. Hallelujah. God rescued us, but he didn't just do that. He restored us spiritually and eternally. And, And so now as God's redeemed and rescued children, we really should care about the things that our Heavenly Father, our Abba, care about, right? Like chips off the old block. Yeah. I mean, we should we should know and love what our father knows and loves. And Psalm 68 is one of my favorite verses in the context of Child Beyond International, this 
children's rescue charity that God you know, placed in my lap. Uh, he's a father to the fatherless. And, and that very same uh, love that rescued me and rescued you, Zach, and rescued you, Chris, and all of us who are listening, is our father's love for all orphans. Yes, spiritually, of course, but also literally. Uh, that's who he's sending us to rescue. And that's really the heart of, of, my, of my rescue. That's my rescue heart mm. because I've been rescued. I, I need to go out and do some rescuing. Uh, it's my call. It's it's my identity. I'm, yeah. As a disciple, I'm a, I'm a rescuer, and so are you, and so is everyone listening. Yeah, I know that there was a book by Mike F uh, Foster called Freeway that said exactly that. You who have been rescued are now called to be a rescuer, which uh, that's always that's always stuck with me. And so, uh, tell me then about yeah, with that in the background, and of course, all of us needing the rescue from God and getting it. And tell me then a little bit of the background and the origin story of Child Beyond International, which is seeking to do just that. It's to rescue the ones that are in oh, need. That, this, yeah, others won't. Yeah. Tell me about it. One of my favorite, this is my absolute favorite story of all the wild rides so far that God has carried. <laughs> Woo, what a ride. And he's always driving. I'm just holding on in the passenger seat with a helmet on, you know, holding on to, with two seat belts on. But uh, uh, anyway, it was back when I, after I left Honolulu uh, after eight years and go back home to Oregon to my home church that I grew up in. And I uh, was called there because my mom and dad were both um, aging and really needed my help. And the church was uh, atrophying and down to about 40 members and was once a thriving church. So God called me back. The, the church and the ministries in a way were doing fine and it was ready for me to move on. And my, you know, my ADD said, go, God's called me because of my spiritual ADD, attention deficit disorder. Let's do something new. And, uh, and so when I went back there and we were growing the church and reaching out to the community, an older couple that was a part of the church, very faithful, had met with me about something else. And as he left, as he got up to leave my office, he said, now, pastor, we have, we have money. We have a gift to give. If you had invested in a new ministry, that's nothing to do with our church. It's outreach and mission. He had a real evangelism heart, hit a rescue heart. And and he didn't say what it was, but yeah. I immediately felt the spirit say, take this seriously. This is mm. the one. Here we go. Mm. Get ready. And so I gathered together uh, a small group of like-minded, mission-minded members of our church that I knew had discipleship hearts and wanted to do something great for God. And we prayed and prayed and, and uh, we'd spent weeks putting together the puzzle uh, of what he really wanted us to do. And when we got done with what it was, as we looked in the conference room, after we shared several weeks of prayer and, and, and yeah. discernment, it was an orphanage in a Central American Spanish speaking country. So sorry, Belize, that doesn't go there. <laughs> and, and so then he, he, he's, we said, okay, God, we get it. Now we, now what? He says, well, go find out how to do it. And so we, um, rent, we investigated 10 different children's homes in, it was in, um, two in Mexico, Tijuana and Juarez. Uh, uh, several in uh, San, um, El Salvador and several in Guatemala. And so we went, these were uh, churches in the U.S. that had missionaries and children's homes in these countries. So we went and learned how, how to do it, how yeah. not to do it. And then we came back and we, we said, okay, uh, to this couple, we're ready for the gift. This is what it is. And they said, yes, that's it. So here's a car. They gave us a title to a car. Okay. And it turned out to be, and I love this part of the story, a 1954 Mercedes-Benz SL Gullwing Sports Coupe. Uh, it's kind of like those James Bond cars. Um, wow. First, first owned by Pat Boone, the actor, uh, bought it in 54, <laughs> Wow. the singer-actor. And he traded it back in in 58 because it was too, he's too tall uh, <laughs> to get in and out of it. So uh, he, this uh, gentleman bought it in 58 as a work car, kept it for all these years, decades and decades, and went through a fire in California and, and survived that. Wow. He turned it into us, and we sold it at auction. Uh, I, I remember we were watching the auction live on the screen in our t <laughs> in our church, and all the members. It sold at auction for one point one million. Holy 1. 2, cow! One point one point two two five million. One, wow! One million two hundred twenty five thousand dollars, and that's the that's how we started the ministry in two thousand four. <laughs> Did you get to drive and, it first? Uh, Did you get it take it first? I got to sit in it. I got to sit in it. <laughs> <laughs> it was so at our incredible. museum in, in, in Hood River. It was in the car <laughs> oh, museum. Gotcha. It got shipped down to Carmel and Pebble Beach and, and got um, 
uh, so auction there. And it was always, it was cool because they were auctioning. This is a phony owned by Pat Boone. And this is for a church in Hood River, Emmanuel Lutheran. And it's going to start a children's home. So be generous. And wow. maybe that helped a little bit. That's but that amazing. was the beginning. Yeah. And so then we had the resources because God has all the resources. He has a cattle on a thousand hills. <laughs> and uh, we just have to be remembering, you know, he's, he has everything we need. Yeah. So we, we started it, we grew it, and then it was thriving. And then the pandemic hit. Oh. And, you know, we, were, we had all these wonderful mission teams coming down from our, our denomination mostly, but several others. We had some Baptist churches coming down and others and uh, doing mission work. And we, we had this beautiful little children's home. So I, uh, and, I, I have a question because, um, so I have church plant that we started about 11 months ago and I, I, I really wanted to have a DNA of serving. Right. Um, and I didn't want to do the kind of serving where, you know, you, I, God bless the people that do this, but I, I, and I know we're called for creation, but I remember doing like road cleanups on, you know, in the wealthiest part of town. And I'm like, this is stupid. You know, like we're just <laughs> wasting our time here. They could, um, and, and, and we've done a lot of things. And one of the things that came up that was number one was, um, I want to, uh, we have a lot of young people and they're really concerned about like child trafficking, that kind of stuff, um, and forced labor, that kind of stuff. And so when I started looking into it several months ago, the, true story, like all I could find was give us money, give us money, give us money. And I mean, I get it. Nonprofits need that. But I, I want to pause real quick because I'm interested in what you said that you're one of the few people that say, come on down. Let's uh, do some work together. So what does that work look like? It's amazing. Right now we have a, a mission team from uh, Colorado, actually. It's a smart time to go down to Guatemala right now. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, and, and they built uh, a, a beautiful house for a family with two small children. And they, uh, they're actually, this is kind of cool. They're not from our denomination, at least mine, Lutheran, mm -hmm. but they uh, are very evangelical. And they're, they're, he's actually, his profession is a Christian illusionist. And he does these, these uh, illusion shows, you know, magic shows in the name of Jesus and bringing the gospel in wonderful, cool ways to uh, schools and um, to churches all over the United States. That's his thing. I met them at a con conference up in Seattle with their booth as the Illusions, and we had our CBI booth, and we fell in love with each other, and we've been working together ever since. So they're down there, and he, he has all his children down there. We have our mission uh, teams are encouraging always to have children to bring your family, start the DNA of discipleship and giving and going as early as you can. Mm -hmm. And so we have these kids and this family and some other of their families down there. They build a house. They've been doing these illusion shows. They put on a vacation Bible school. And uh, they built some uh, cook stoves. They're having a blast down there, and they're playing with all our children at our children's home, mm -hmm. you know, at our at our orphanage, and and uh, helping in that way too. So, any mission team that comes down, we have this year is the best year yet because we're finally getting momentum yeah. from the pandemic. Twenty twenty three was our first full year of getting teams back down. Cool. Twenty twenty four, we have seventeen teams lined up already. Uh, we're very very humbled and excited about that because. When, when people come down and experience a third world country or a, a country that's completely different culturally and impoverished and, and they see the difference it makes, especially young people, kids mm -hmm. and teenagers, it really shifts their worldview and, and it can dramatically change the, in some cases, God can completely change the direction of their very lives mm. because of that mission trip. You got, you know, they got to come and experience it at least yeah. once. That's yeah. really, really cool. And so, yeah, really cool. And we I, do mission trips really well. And I just love that, you know, all the different pieces of this story of God weaving and working like through you, but also through a couple that just happened to have a 1950s Mercedes Pat Boone car. Do you know anybody that, else that has one of those? Cause I could use but one. I'm just thinking like the generosity of, it took the generosity of that couple, uh, you know, pitched obviously with, with you and, and the idea and a team of people to check it out. And now there's all these other churches and all these other people involved. Um, and, 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 and it's to help one orphanage that has what, 20 to 24 kids. And I know we have 20 kids always full. Yeah. And I know that these kids like, uh, talk to me a little bit about, because I think this is a little what's unique about what you're doing as opposed to some of the other uh, ministries that are international that, uh, you know, serve whole communities or maybe masses of people, um, is I, I believe, as you've said, like the 20 are, are more of the uh, at-risk and very vulnerable, like children that actually 
uh, not actually, but that but really need rescue, right? So who is the who is the child that's getting rescued on the other side? Yeah, exactly, man. That's just my heart. So getting back to just really quickly reminding us about Luke 15 and the parable of the lost sheep and yeah. what Jesus really cares about is the one. Yeah. And, you know, of course he cares about everybody, but he really cares about that one that's lost that he has to go and find and no matter what it takes and, and, and bring them back into his fold, into his, uh, the, the sheepfold. So ultimately that's the, the whole ministry of Child Beyond International. And, and when, when God laid this in my lap, I originally thought we were going to have an orphanage traditional orphanage yeah. that we would have these kids until they were 18. We'd grow them up and one of them would be the president of Guatemala. <laughs> that, was my you know, that was it. And then of course, um, with the shift in the attitudes towards institutional ch children's homes, uh, both the Guatemala government and the United Nations, um, we realized that, yeah, they're, they're right. This isn't the best place to raise a child. They need to be in a home that's designed that God has created a, a husband, a father and a mother and children together, raising them as, uh, you know, like it really should be, like he created us to, to yeah. have a family. And so we are working really hard on that. As you, as you talk about uh, the, the, the big ministries that do the children's care, like Compassion and World Vision mm -hmm. and those, uh, that's amazing. I was a Compassion sponsor for many, many years until Child Beyond came along and I, of course, shifted my focus. <laughs> but ultimately, they're, they're ministering to mostly families and children within those families to make sure they stay healthy, strong, bring the gospel, yeah. all those beautiful things. But we're the ones that have the great humble privilege of catching the ones that are falling through the cracks, those that have no parents, those that have lost their parents. I, I think of our, one of our first little babies that came to us back in 2006 when we first opened our children's home that her name was Angela and her father in, in a rage shot her, his mo her mother mm -hmm. in front of her, blood splattered on her whole low kitty mm -hmm. shirt, killed him shelf next. And she was found wandering the streets crying. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and so she came to us and we, by God's grace, she rest, she was rescued by us through the government. They brought her to us and, and God in his mercy restored Angela emotionally physically not, you know, she wasn't unhealthy, but physically, emotionally and spiritually. And then we got her a forever home. We released her into her forever home. And now we have this reinforcement piece where we're keeping an eye on her, making sure she's okay, making sure her family has what's needed. And, and just recently, I don't know if anybody can see this. This is Mirna. This is my favorite little girl right now. This is um, our church here in Waikoloa is rescuing her. Um, we have all these churches to rescue each one of our children. We still need several, but we, Mirna, she was found on the border between Guatemala and Mexico at about one year old, and she was um, impoverished. She hadn't had any uh, food or water for maybe days, mm. and she was whimpering on, along the side of the road in a bush. And this was a, along those big caravans that were coming a couple years ago from the south up towards Mexico into the United States. And somebody had to adopt, had uh, abandoned her mm. or lost her. And so a woman found her, took her to the authorities. They took her to the hospital. The doctor said she had one day to live, Oh my gosh. but she recovered. She's a sweet, sweet little girl. Hmm. Her name's Mirna because this, the woman that found her, her name was Mirna. So they gave her that name wow. and then she has to have a last name. And so our children's home director, Paola, gave her the name Gracia, which means grace. Hmm. So her name is Mirna Gracia. Mirna means kindness or love and, and um, Gracia means grace. So the loving kindness and, and grace of, G of wow. Jesus saved and rescued this little girl and she's thriving she's a spitball <laughs> she's just like i'm tough wow. and uh you better so, be so if, yeah how, if you fought that off at one years old at the border how old goodness. is she now uh she's two and a half mm -hmm. and she's been she's going to be with us long term because there's the government's still trying to figure out what what uh, country she's from but we they have no idea mm -hmm. uh, they just know she's not guatemalan she even could be cuban so these are the kind of stories that we have that God brings to us, these unique, special, precious ones mm -hmm. that the Lord has, you know, he needs somebody. He calls us to do this. So we rescue each one of these children by the government bringing them to us. We restore them over a period of nine months to a year, sometimes longer with Myrna. Yeah. Uh, holistically, we have a doctor on staff. We have a, a, a psychologist on staff, social worker, a uh, nutritionist, uh, we have, of course, all the nannies that take care of them and the director and the 
just on and on. All this staff is to take care of these beautiful 20 children wow. to re to restore them. And then the celebration is to release them into a forever family where they belong, mm -hmm. where they, where God would want them. And mm -hmm. so then the joy is that not, we don't say goodbye and oh, I hope that everything's okay. But the fourth <laughs> R rescue, restore, release. And the fourth R reinforce through our family transformation ministry. Oh, it's, a, it's going great. Uh, I just got some great news uh, today from one of our board members, uh, John, who lives in Washington. He's down there right now for a month in Guatemala, and he's working with Estevan, our family transformation director, uh, going to visit all these families that we've released children to yeah. and making sure that everything is going well, that they have, they're have they connected to a church, that they have all their needs met, that they're getting enough food, that the, they're, they're healthy, and that they know Jesus. Mm. And that's long term. So we actually have relationships with these children up until their adulthood and beyond. In fact, we've had children that have been released to come back with their families and bring donations to the children's home because wow. their the adopted parents were so grateful for what we were able to do with these beautiful children that are now theirs forever. That's wow. so good. Um, so the story is a, it's a cycle of redemption yeah. from lost to redeemed to restored and then eventually some of them will end up probably becoming strong disciples and missionaries to their own people. Come on, that's good. I love it. Rescue, restore, release, reinforce. Uh, what a what a cool strategy and you know, I'm uh, both inspired and convicted because I think in my own personal life or walk with Christ, even as a pastor and even even in red letter you know, ministry that we that I do uh, I can focus sometimes so much on quantity and the masses, and I think that's good. Like that's a, a healthy thing to do, but also there's a quality. There's the one, and I just want to encourage and challenge a listener out there. Um, like I'm not saying don't you know maximize and focus on the masses and how you can help, but is there something in your life, someone in your life, um, that, you know, gets more time from you and more care from you and more love from you um, that's fallen through the cracks yes. that you might be um, the solution to bring them back to Jesus. And uh, look at that in your life. And if not, like locally, uh, you know, then especially globally, uh, what, a, what a cool opportunity you have. And, and I think that's what makes what makes your organization so unique and different and, and amazing is, uh, you know, that for uh, it's usually right one church that sponsors a whole church that sponsors one child as opposed to not not sponsors we, we get away from that word sponsors rescues rescues, rescues mm -hmm. one child they yeah. rescue yeah. that that child and they get to watch that yeah. child grow and thrive until that celebration of release and then guess what here's your next rescue <laughs> child <laughs> perfect but i think that's awesome and that's that's a reason to celebrate like doing god's work um, and so, so cool. So Jeff, shortly, you and I, uh, we're going to be having a webinar. This is um, one I'm not going to miss. Yeah. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go well, to this good, one. Cause yeah. you miss a lot of stuff. I do miss anyway. a lot of stuff, but this one, this is a big deal right so, here. So we're going to have a webinar designed, um, specifically for church leaders, um, to help their churches fulfill this mission of reaching the lost, especially the one. So what can church leaders, pastors expect in that webinar? Oh man, I'm really looking forward to this, Zach. Thank you so much for your partnership with us. That's God just continues to bring his heart up of, of outreach and mission to his disciples together to make it even better. So I, I'm amazed at what God has been doing so yeah. far with Child Beyond International yeah. in Guatemala. But we really are just up to our ankles in his <laughs> deep ocean of mission vision down there. It's so desperately needed. Of, of all the countries in the Western Hemisphere, Guatemala, we know now why he sent us there. It's the most um, impoverished and it has the most uh, malnutrition rates, mm. and uh, it, it's still recovering from that 30-year uh, civil war back in the late 90s when it finished up there, and it's still recovering. The, you know, the orphans from that developed more orphans, and, and that's why we are there. God has called us to rescue. And so we invite um, all the church leaders to come and find out uh, what, what this is really all about because truly mission adventures in a distant country and a different culture it really changes our perspective unlike any other effort that we could have. It restores our purpose for the gospel. It, it grows our faith like no other life experience. And I, I obviously am very biased, but I've seen it work so well that mission trips, uh, short-term mission trips, even though they're not really long, short terms, five, seven days, are one of the most effective faith-building discipleship mm -hmm. opportunities 
that God provides for us, not yep. only to make a huge spiritual difference in the lives of one soul at a time, but in each one of our own spiritual lives as well, and in the health and the focus of our churches. And mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a huge thing. And and even becoming a rally to the rescue church is 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 showing it, it builds discipleship, it builds passion in a congregation because they're all one church rescuing one child and uh, it's a huge blessing so i can't wait to share all about it cool we'll, we'll dive deeper and uh you know especially if there's a pastor or church leader that wants to find out more we'll put the link to register for the webinar in the show notes uh we'll also put the link yep. if you're already like sold like i want to rally to the rescue i want to oh, be one of those churches i'm, I'm so one. excited by this podcast like we yeah. literally were thinking about this in orlando florida and i feel like this is a god moment cool. like i'm gonna we're going to be reaching out. Cool. Yeah. So we're going to put First those links in there. And talk about it. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> Very good. Uh, so I, can't... <laughs> I think he's too nervous. I'm 50 to do now, that now, man. I don't know if I'm jumping <laughs> off any cliffs. <laughs> I'll be there, the one kicking you in the leg. Yeah, like, exactly. Come on, man. Let's go. This young punk's kicking yeah. me in the leg. And then, I, but I won't jump out. I know so exactly. I know too, you. But, yeah. Um, hey, Jeff. This is great. So we'll put all the links for that in the show notes if people want to connect with Child Beyond International and what you're doing, yeah. and, and of course register for that that free webinar. Um, so we ask every guest this question kind of on the way uh, out to close it up. If there's one thing, we want this to challenge people to be greater disciples in their own everyday walk. So if there's one challenge that you would issue um, that someone can do practically this week to be a greater disciple of Jesus, what is that challenge? Uh, I'm glad you, that you gave me this uh, question, this one early, so I could think about it a little bit, but it's pretty <laughs> simple. It's really simple. It, I mean, Jesus lives in our hearts through his spirit. And we all, I hope, believe that and know that and experience that. Of course, we can't believe Jesus is Savior unless we have the Holy Spirit. So, yeah. So we have the ability in us. Let's remember our identity. Uh, we even have the or exhortation, do I, say, do I dare say, the command to see everyone we see through Jesus's eyes of compassion. My, mm. So my challenge to all our faith fueled followers that are listening, our fellow disciples of the Lord, is I really encourage you, it's so simple, uh, memorize Matthew 9, 36. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I love that word in the Greek, compassion, splagnitsomai, it means from the bowels. It's like the deepest kind of feeling. And we know all around us, we see these people that have no clue that because they're blind spiritually, they don't have the spirit, that they're harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. They really are. And, and so there's the challenge. Throughout this coming week, as you interact with, yes, those you know and you love, and you, those that, especially those that you come in contact with that you don't know, you know, the, the clerk at the store or <laughs> yeah. the, when you go to the baseball game or, or to your kid's soccer match or wherever you are, when you see them, remember that verse and know and, and try to see them through the grace-filled lens of our compassionate Savior. Mm -hmm. And then, guess what? You, then the, here's the big part. Yeah, that's easy. Okay, oh, I feel so sad for them. No, then you treat them like Jesus would treat them. And I guarantee you, if you do something like that, at least with the one or two uh, that you meet with that kind of compassion, you're, you're going to have the most memorable and inspiring week that you've had in a long time. Come on, that's, that's awesome. So that, my encouragement is, is enjoy sharing the compassion of Jesus in, in a tangible, literally positive way and, and watch your life be blessed. That's cool. That's a, the, uh, this, not the first time, but I think the second time that that word compassion kind of without prompt has come up on this season. And uh, I think there's something to that, listeners. So if you take that on and you uh, do that challenge, you, you memorize, was it Mark 936? Is that right? Yeah, no, Matthew. Matthew, Matthew 936. Matthew 9.36. So memorize Matthew 9.36 and get that compassion inside of you. And, and I mentioned it already on this podcast. Uh, the compassion of Jesus always has action attached to it. So we want to be deeply moved in our splagnizomai, our guts, our bowels. I, I preached on that not long ago and talked about if you want to know <laughs> what, yeah, if you want to know what splagnizomai feels like, Whoa. just rock the Taco Bell uh, <laughs> value menu, and uh, that's a little bit of that compa <laughs> that splagnizomai. But no, when we see somebody, it should move us to action, stir us to action. That's what that's getting at. So if you take that challenge, hashtag Red Letter Disciple. We want to support you uh, along. 
along the way and encourage you. Um, and that's awesome. Jeff, you've been so great. Chris, what you got? All right. Uh, so like I said, my mom was born in Hawaii. My grandfather and grandmother lived there for a while. My aunts and uncles uh, lived there for a while. And they told me one thing one time that uh, they were never considered real Hawaiians. You know, they were... Uh, they were just kind of tourists. They were not considered. So you've been there, what, eight years? Eight years the first time, a little over a year now the second time on this island. Okay, so what Zach and I wanted to do was to give you a little quiz to figure out if you're truly a real Hawaiian. Mm. Okay? So there, <laughs> there we go. go. I'll let's, be happy to are you, go Let's go. Uh, question number one. Known as the, bro, the brow of the tuna in Hawaiian, what is the English name of the volcanic cone that is Hawaii's most popular state park? Uh, that would be on my island now. Um, Halakalikiola or the Volcano National Park. That is incorrect. It is Diamond Head, the most photographed. Oh, I, that's that's so old for a volcano. It's like, wow, uh, he's talking about. Then, hey, you, listen, you, you can make excuses all day. You're 0 for 1. Okay, pal? <laughs> I was on top. Of, I climbed Diamond Head, though. Do I get credit? Okay, half a credit. 0. 0.5 out of 1. I That's like good. His, his name, the Halukalala. Halukalala. Yeah, that, that sounded actually like sounded pretty speaking incredible. Speaking in tongues yeah. on our podcast. Hey, but. like, did like, did <laughs> <laughs> Speaking in tongues. All right. Uh, to honor a man who became more famous as the nickname for a popular food, Captain Cook, one of the first Europeans to come to Hawaii, gave Hawaii this name what was it once known as it was known as uh, the sandwich island boom 1.5 out of 2 good job you've got it okay what timex watch was inter introduced at a hawaiian olympic uh, athletic event in 1985 and quickly became the best selling watch in the united states <laughs> a Timex brand yes. watch? Yes. So think about Timex. What was one of the big events that Hawaii, you could only, like, you, a lot surfing. of. Surfing? Why is it? Well, the surfing is the only thing you could do in Hawaii. That is, back then. That is good. That's a great answer. It's so horribly wrong. Watches? No, it's, uh, <laughs> it's the Iron Man. The Iron Man Timex oh. was the. Uh, all right, that, okay. that wasn't a fair yeah. question. My wife just volunteered at the Women's Iron Man about two months ago, so she was Another half point, it sounds half like. Half point, all right. <laughs> two out of, you got like what? Uh, I have a t-shirt that I often wear. <laughs> well, you should have worn it. You should have worn it. I don't know what to tell you, pal. No, you guys. All right, this is it. This is by far the toughest question we're going to give you. Only a true Hawaiian. Oh, good, so good, so well. Only a true Hawaiian would know this, all right? Zach would not even get close to this. He's so not Hawaiian. In order to be labeled a cone blend of coffee. What is the minimum percentage of coffee beans in a batch that must be grown in Hawaii? And I'll cushion you. 100%. That's 10%. It's 10%. <laughs> no, that's baloney. I know. No, there's no baloney in it. I know, but um, honestly, we don't drink anything but 100% Kona coffee. Really? That's, that, yeah. It's only it's a half hour away from here. You got to. That's amazing. I can't wait to do that. Okay. Well, I don't think. Where, where'd you get your facts? I, I don't think from that's a Hawaiian true. that I met, Jimmy Hawaii. Yeah. Uh, it was a guy yeah, that I met from in Omaha. That, that Hawaiian named Google. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think you're Hawaiian. You're way more Hawaiian than us. Oh, I'm so Howley. You're that's what we call us. Howley. Well, quick fun fact: Howley is what we're all called. And it's, it used to be a, like a, a negative term. Sure. Now it's just that's who we are. But it really meant without air. That's the Hawaiian word without air. Hmm. So with white. Oh, I you know, see. Like I see. White. I see. So we had no air. So that's that's why we're all Howleys. You two are very Howleys. Oh, there you go. There you go. yes, we are. At least I have a tan. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard up here, man. It's yeah. been negative 40 degrees wind chill. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Again, just doing the Lord's work, uh, you know. Yeah. So you uh, you feel yeah. guilty uh, being there. You had to go all the way to Guatemala to do the Lord's work, you know. I so. like that he's 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 got such a rough life. He's got such a rough life that his office is on a golf course in Hawaii. <laughs> this is pretty tough, man. All no right. wonder you're so joyful, <laughs> Jeff. If people yeah. want to connect with you, where can they find you these days? Oh, uh, the best the golf the course. Best, well, yeah, for email, it's just. Pastor J Mueller at gmail.com, you know, J M U E L L E R, Pastor J Mueller at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. Cool. But just also go to our website, uh, uh, childbeyond.org, or our Facebook page, Child Beyond, 
and check out what we're doing. It's amazing what God is doing. I would love, love, love to have more partners uh, and it will grow your discipleship heart it, and come down and see cool. what God's doing. Get your church involved. Be a rally church. Yeah. Let's save those ones. Come, come on, on. Let's do it. All right, let's listeners, go. there you go. Hey, we're going to put all those uh, links in our show notes at redletterpodcast.com. Jeff, Check thank out. you so much for uh, being with us. If you answered one more of those questions correctly, by the way, you would have won a <laughs> 1950s Mercedes. That's true. That's true. Uh, now, uh, but anyway, yeah, that's yeah. okay. You lost that's out, right. but Shut we're up, all guys. winners. We'll that's send right. you some gummy bears as a <laughs> consolation prize. Victory in Jesus, man. Victory in Jesus. What a ride. All right, thanks, Jeff. Appreciate you, bro. Thank you, guys. Mahalo. Mahalo. <laughs> Mahalo. Well, Jeff Mueller, wow. Uh, thank you just honestly for being you. What what a light of Christ you are in this world. And thanks for the reminder of how important it is to reach the one. Uh, I know in my world, sometimes I can get so caught up with quantity and church growth and measuring targets that it's really good to just come back and hear about how God calls us to rescue the one. So hey, if you want to connect with Child Beyond International, which I hope you do, you can find out more about their great work at childbeyond.org. And uh, a couple things with that. If you are a pastor or church leader that's looking to partner with a global organization for a transformative one-week mission experience that will not only change a life in Guatemala, but change the lives of those who go from your church, you got to link in with Jeff Mueller and his team at childbeyond.org. And again, I mentioned at the front, we're having that webinar for leaders, pastors, on April 11th, where we're going to talk about global ministry and the importance of doing it right. So you can find out the link to register for that free webinar coming up on April 11th and all the links from today's show at our show notes. You can find them at redletterpodcast.com. Next week's a fun episode. Uh, we've got Kenny Jang coming on to the Red Letter Disciple. Kenny is a leading voice in the Christian space about artificial intelligence. And so we're going to geek out on the pros and cons of AI and how they can be used for the glory of Christ or not. And you know my heart, if there's a new tool that we know is going to be utilized for the masses, we've got to figure out not how to run from it, but how to use it in a way that glorifies God. And so I'm grateful for Kenny and his leadership in this area. I promise you, you're going to learn a lot. So don't miss next week's episode. If you're wondering like, what is AI and how do I use it as a disciple or just in life? You're going to learn a lot. So don't miss it next week. That's going to be happening. And the best way to ensure you don't miss it is hit that follow, hit that subscribe on your favorite platform. We were on all the big ones, especially Apple Podcasts and Spotify. If you want to watch the video, that's my personal fave. We're on YouTube as well. And there's usually one or two things each episode that like, it's just fun to watch it on video. So hey, come back next week for the brand new episode of the Red Letter Disciple. We'll see you back 